Welcome to the Life Stop 101 podcast, dedicated to sharing stories and insights to inspire you to always make your mental and emotional wellness a top priority. We talk to people who share their personal journeys and experiences, as well as to people who share their professional expertise. And there will also be other times when we share personal tips and stories, which will hopefully somehow spark that aha moment for you too. Because we all have those moments when we think, I wish I had known that earlier in life. That's what Life Stuff 101 is all about. Our discussion today Today is for general information purposes and not meant to be specific advice. For personalized support and specific answers to questions you may have, please consult the appropriate medical or mental health care professional. Now here's your host who's on this wild adventure ride of life just like you, and yes, a real life person who's actually slipped on a banana peel along the way. Mental wellness coach and psychotherapist, Mio Yokoi. Hello and welcome to another episode of Life Stuff 101. My name is Mio Yokoi and it's my goal to inspire you to make your mental and emotional health and wellness one of your top priorities. And for this month, I'm dedicating episodes to different aspects, experiences, and insights about relationships. And if you haven't had a chance, there have already been some really great discussions and insights from my guests about relationships in episodes 26 and 27 with Katie Sullivan, who shared how unexpected vulnerability contributed to recalibrating and saving her marriage, and episode 28 with Lacey Broussard, who is a sex coach and who spoke to us about the importance of having a more engaged and connected relationship with ourselves as individuals and physical beings. And you can go back and listen to those episodes at lifestuff101.com. And there's also a resource page there that's updated with all the recommended resources provided by each of my guests. Today, my guest is Matt Cahill, who's a registered psychotherapist in Toronto, Canada, who works with both couples and individuals in private practice. He'll be sharing his experiences and insights working with couples, but also you'll be hearing a conversation between two therapists about how relationship therapy can be a valuable resource and not necessarily about the end of the road for folks who may be having difficulties in their relationship. As you'll be hearing, having been engaged in my own personal therapy for over 15 years and working as a therapist in private practice for the last 10 years or so, I'm immersed in a way of thinking about and understanding of how therapy can be and also the potentials of therapy. So I know that for those who aren't, these kinds of discussions could be helpful to give you a glimpse of ways in which therapy can be utilized. One way of thinking about therapy, and especially when it's approached in certain ways, it can be a resource which can give you perspectives, feedback, and tools which you may not otherwise have had. Whether you as an individual would like to have a more in-depth understanding of how you are in relationships, or if you and your partner are looking to explore your dynamics, or to learn ways of better understanding one another, therapy can be a very valuable resource. That's really just the tip of the iceberg as to how therapy can be helpful for relationships, but I hope that my discussion with Matt today will give you a glimpse of different ways it could be helpful. With that, please enjoy my conversation with Matt Cahill. Thanks so much for joining me today, Matt. It's my pleasure to be here. So before we jump into our discussion about relationship and couples therapy today, I'd like to ask each of my guests to start off with a fun fact. Uh, So Matt, what's a fun fact you can share with us? So in a previous lifetime, I worked uh, for about 20 years in film and television. I worked in TV commercials, children's entertainment, performing arts, television shows, and perhaps most, uh, well, if we're going for the popular vote, I worked on no less than four Saw films, those would be the ridiculously contrived horror movies that belong to the Saw franchise. Wow, that is actually quite a fun fact. Yeah, I I try, I try. When you ask for a fun fact, I just want to hit it out of the park, you know? (laughs) Just, I guess, a quick question about that. I mean, you know, I'm not a horror a movie fan. So sure. um, it's, it's tough for me to kind of conceptualize it because I don't 
think I've ever seen a horror movie from from the beginning to end. But do you mm. like being on set? Do you get that sen- same sense of suspense or 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 the horror, the violence that are shown in the movies? Hell no. But what I would say is is that I actually don't personally consider the Saw franchise to be horror movies. I find them to be kind of like, I don't know, moralistic thrillers. I'll also be honest in that I because I did a lot of my time in post-production, I didn't spend a lot of time on set. That said, I did spend a lot of time as an assistant editor where you're going through sort of open footage and, and seeing everything go from clapper to clapper. And so it kind of, it's interesting to see how these things are made and to kind of look behind the the curtains. Uh, But no, it certainly kind of broke down the fourth wall in terms of the the idea of what a horror movie is, that's for sure. So I guess on the post-production side then, or even like working in that industry, do you watch movies? Like, are you able to suspend the whole, like, um, what do they call it? When you, when you, when you sort of of disbelief. Uh, Yeah. 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 I, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because I kind of realized after graduating from film school, you know, you 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 kind of realize, oh, wow, I've got this like weird sort of Jedi ability to watch films and understand what's going on behind the scenes. And yet I actually so in other words, I appreciate being out of the industry because I can kind of suspend my disbelief once more. That doesn't mean that I I or I'm not able to see what's happening behind the scenes. And I I certainly do appreciate my sort of film school education as well as just my real life education for informing me about what sort of all contributes to making a a TV show or a film. One of the TV shows I worked on actually, uh, which is quite influential, is uh, Slings and Arrows, which is a kind of a hugely influential show for people who love theater. And as someone who had been part of theater on and off and was just kind of a kind of a wonderful experience working on what is essentially kind of a love letter to that kind of environment. So I have a lot of feelings and and thoughts on working in that environment and and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. You know, what's interesting about that, too, as you were just talking about from an industry or a film industry perspective, but also maybe, you know, with perhaps your experience with theater as well, just being able to see it from the inside, but also now having that view from the outside. I was wondering if some of that or maybe we can talk about, you know, as as we jump into our conversation, but that perspective, even in the therapy work that you do, right? Because like there are, you know, when it comes to individuals, when it comes to couples, we'll be you know, speaking specifically about relationships, there is like almost like an orchestrated drama or an orchestrated theater of sorts, I think, that could be created. And for you to be as a relationship therapist or a therapist, like being able to see into people's narratives, I guess, right? Like I wonder, or maybe I'm stretching it a little bit, but I wonder if there is in some ways some connection there. I think if if there is a, a running thread I might sort of share between the two who would be the idea of vulnerability. I think, you know, if you are going to do anything of consequence on stage, you, you have to be able to lower your defenses first, I think, just as a human being and, and an actor. And, and, and then as you get closer to whatever character uh, you are playing, you, you have to sort of just realize that you have nothing to gain from having your guard up. Now, that's it's maybe easier to say this in the context of live theater or television or film than it is for couples therapy. Because uh, with couples therapy, I think, you know, off the top of my head, I think there is a fear of the person you are sitting with judging you based upon whatever kind of honest reflection or insight you're willing to share. Mm. Well, um, and before we actually get sort of into the nitty gritty of things, just want to give folks a bit of a background. So you and I, Matt, both studied with the Toronto Institute of Relational Psychotherapy. And yeah, well, we weren't in the same year and didn't technically train together. It's been over 10 years for us both working as psychotherapists in private practice. And it's been interesting in, in some ways. Our paths have crossed in, you know, different ways over over the years. Yeah. And, you know, I really 
think of you as a very valued colleague of mine. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with you about your experiences working with couples in relationship therapy. And I think it's a valuable thing to talk about because, you know, you and I, like we're knee deep into the therapy thing, so we get it. But there's, you know, the more that I'm doing this podcast, the more that I'm realizing that therapy is sort of like a mystical thing for many people, you know, like they, they know... Yeah, they see things on TV or like it's interesting you were talking about being in film and television. So maybe that is their context for what therapy is. But I think specifically around relationship therapy or what happens in couples therapy, I think that it's it's a really valuable thing to talk about so that people can maybe have a sense of what to expect. But that said, I think that often people reach out to me because they see that I'm a relational psychotherapist and they can confuse that with relationship therapy. Uh, which is different a different thing. How would you describe what relational psychotherapy is? Yeah, so it is, I would, I guess, hmm, where to start? I, I would probably say that it deals with how we relate or, or, or what our relationship is to Various aspects of our life, our relationship with our friends, our relationship with our family, our co-workers, our relationship with things like drinking, our relationship with substances, our relationship with sex. And, and I think ultimately how this all informs our relationship with ourself. And, and so it's relational. It's all sort of kind of informs ultimately our sort of sense of identity and our way of interpreting the world around us. Right. And and for me, I personally work only with adult individuals in relational approach, but you also work with couples as well as individuals. Is that right? I do. I do. Um, it, that's in it's sort of a certainly, a, I guess, to choose a word, a more vibrant sort of approach than necessarily with individuals, just because you have two people in the room at the same time. Right. And how would you describe what the relational approach to relationship therapy would be? It's a good question and, and maybe harder to answer in that it's relational therapy, I think, uh, one of the foundational ideas uh, that sort of informs it is uh, attachment theory. And I think this comes up very much in my work with couples. And attachment theory informs a lot of the kind of the frustration that couples might find themselves going through when, for example, one person, they have this let's call it a, a constitution, where if there's a problem, they need to solve it now. They need to get to the bottom now. Let's talk about this. Let's, you know, solve it tonight. And they'll be in a relationship, you know, whether they're married or whatever, with somebody whose constitution is sort of like, yeah, I, I, I need time to think and reflect. I don't, I can't, you know, I, I, I'm, you know, I'm uncomfortable uh, being put on the spot. This is actually a very common dynamic I see with couples. And, you know, and I think it's informed one way of, of looking at it, because there are many, is through that kind of attachment theory filter, where you, you obviously have one person who is sort of like, you know, they are needing to draw the other out and and sort of get to the bottom of things, whereas the other person is kind of like, no, I, I they're more avoidant, obviously, and they're kind of like, no, I, I just need to kind of like have time to chill. And, and it's because a lot of this is in, is happening on a less than conscious basis. I think it it it, it can maybe create a lot of problems because we're not we're not we're not able to step outside of ourselves when this sort of things are happening and, and and it can lead to to conflict obviously 
And it's so true. I often, I don't work with couples, but I, what I often uh, use the analogy when I'm, when I'm working with folks is this idea of like being in the eye of the storm mm. and you can't see the storm when you're in it. Mm. And um, so you can see the stuff like whipping around and, you know, you're trying to just keep things maybe like nailed down or whatever it is. But until the storm passes, you often can't see what it was that you were actually in. And I'm sure that that's also true when it comes to how couples can experience one another or their relationships as well. Yes, it's and let's face it, nobody there. Well, there are very few people who are comfortable in a conflict. Our defenses get up. We are less likely to feel empathetic or to want to be vulnerable, you know, if we're feeling we're going to be criticized. So it's and those aren't necessarily the factors that go into every couple who wish to step into my office. But it's it's certainly it's certainly there, uh, you know, some of the time. Mm -hmm. And we've kind of gotten into sort of the meat of like what can be part of the conflict between a couple that would come in. But in your experiences, what would you say are some of the more common reasons why couples may decide to engage in therapy? I I think communication is, I would put it at number one. And I think it goes back to what I was saying in that a couple will come and say, we're having a problem with communication. And yet when I say, okay, how are you communicating? They're kind of like, well, we're just, we're just disagreeing. And, And that's when I will typically kind of try to draw out real life examples First off, so that we're not talking about theory, I think theory informs my work as a therapist. But, you know, I just I think it ends there. I think if if clients don't necessarily want to, they're not necessarily looking to be psychoeducated. They, they want to kind of have a sense of of what's going on. And so I will bring up attachment theory, but but I'll bring up attachment theory if it's applicable after I hear what's an example of what's happening in in their real lived experience, right? And so, yes, communication is one thing. I also have had couples come in, and I really appreciate this, couples who come in prior to a major sort of life event. So uh, marriage or or having their first child uh, in particular, where it's just like, okay, we, we want to just kind of, you know, air some things out while we're on the precipice of these things uh, so that we can kind of gain a, a you yeah, know, a better understanding. What would you say would be the, and again, this is, this would just be an estimate, but the, this, how that shakes out in terms of folks who are in a place where they're needing to figure something out for their relationship versus being almost proactive in, like you were saying, on, on the precipice of a certain like life event that might be happening. What would you say the split is? I would probably say anecdotally 70-30. So I would say 70% would be around, to use a broad term, communication, and 30 in that proactive sort of group. And, and, you know, I will kind of just add on there that there is, because we need to kind of look at reality squarely, a factor here that not every couple can afford couples therapy. And I, I think if, you know, if I could make a, if I could wave a magic wand and make couples therapy uh, covered under, you know, uh, whatever sort of insurance scheme, the whoever is listening to this uh, has at their disposal, I think more people would be obliged to kind of go, hey, you know what, maybe a couple of months before we get married, maybe we should just have a couple of sessions with a couple's therapist and just kind of kick the tires a bit and then sort of see what's going on. Or, or maybe we should kind of, you know, talk openly about our concerns prior to our first child to see what, what, what's kind of maybe scaring us that we're afraid to share with each other. So I think those who come to me proactively, as you say, and that's a good way to put it, have no offense to them. Uh, I think they're, they're more likely to have a certain amount of financial privilege around that. Right. 
But uh, there's also, hmm, that's interesting, right? Like to, to also have that financial privilege, but an, an awareness of being to look forward and whether those things are related potentially. Okay. The, is, is the ability for the, to, to have the financial means to be able to pursue therapy also allow for folks to have more of the forward thinking um, kind of perspective? That's, and that's a, I think that's a very good beginning of a discussion, right? Because uh, a, a question that we might split off of that is that if you're working uh, three part-time jobs in order to make ends meet, do you even have the time to kind of say to yourself, man, I should really like, we should really like see a therapist before we have our first kid or something, you know, because I think there's a lot of people out there where quite frankly, it's about being able to cover your rent, put food on the table, you know, and aside from that, it's a question as to either whether there's money left over or whether there's uh, an awareness uh, that that one has of, of what's happening. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, and I think that the, the splinter off into, I guess, a little bit of a different discussion. But the, this idea, um, we're we're in Canada, so and and we have um, this provincial health system, and even though uh, the mental health system in where we are is actually pretty convoluted and really confusing for most people to navigate, but to even have like a resource, to have a public resource for folks to navigate relationships or navigate big life events. I mean, it, it's great to have therapy as, as, as that potential resource. And maybe some people don't even think about it as a resource that way. But it's, I think, great that we're talking about it so that hopefully it, it becomes more of a part of the conversation. But absolutely. Yeah. But it's really unfortunate in a lot of ways that whether it isn't it should be maybe part of the, the public education system or something where maybe we talk about how to engage in relationship, what that looks like. I agree. I agree. We, we you know, it, it's I think and, and maybe this is answering a question you might have on your list. Who knows? But if there's one misconception people have about therapy is that, oh, no you know, Tyler and Jenner are having a problem. Why do you say that? Because they're in couples therapy. And it's like, no, it doesn't mean they have a problem. It probably means that they're, they're maybe trying to stave off a problem, right? So couples therapy can be preventative. But to go back to what you were saying, I fairly certain that if somebody were to look at whatever is going on at their local community center, maybe their library, maybe depending upon their belief system, their local church, maybe they have something or or some sort of means to help couples with their relationships that are not exactly couples therapy, but are, are helpful nonetheless. For sure. And you did talk about that misconception that people might have about like there's still the stigma about ooh, like there's a problem for people to be engaged in therapy. What other common misunderstandings do you think that people have when actually e- even people f- who are engaging in couples therapy? I, I would say a big one is couples therapy is the beginning of the end. I think that's a big one. Uh, and And it's not true. But it feels like, oh, no, we're on the downward slide because we're in couples therapy. And let's face it, because of that stigma, if either person or both people in the relationship have a a weakness or an ability uh, around catastrophizing, then then it might just make it all the all the more hard for either of them to go into therapy with an open mind or, or with some sort of vulnerability or some sense of what we're doing this to improve things rather than to kind of just, you know, uh, uh, neatly end our relationship. Right. But there's also, I think, the fact that there are folks who might be toward the end of their relationship that where they might engage in couples therapy to maybe sort that out. And and I think that there is also something really powerful in the idea that sometimes two people might have come to there might have been a time where it made sense for two people to come together and be in a relationship, but then things change over time. Yes. I I, I agree and I, I would say that there have been couples who they want to 
use therapy in order to preserve the relationship they have, right? They might be nearing the end of their marriage or they might be nearing the end of their cohabitation, but they want to work to retain the friendship or retain a sense of understanding and respect. And so, and this might be sort of a bit of a leading question, I guess, but I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about people coming in or maybe like just holding this idea that when something doesn't work out or when the relationship doesn't work out, that it's a failure on the part of the individual or the part of the couple. Yeah, I feel that we as a society, and I can only speak to kind of Western society, I feel that we are kind of still caught in a kind of stoic view of relationships where it's kind of like, oh boy, it didn't work. Oh, what does this mean? You know, like what, what does this mean that that's it? I have, you know, lost. Does this somehow define the fact that I'm not marriage material or uh, partner material? And I think it's I think ultimately we society is going to need to try to broaden the idea that first off, I think we need to, to, well, maybe open up our idea of what a relationship is and perhaps also to understand that if a relationship doesn't work, that isn't a mark against either of the people involved. It's just, it just is. It might have been a great relationship, let's say four years, but then maybe a miserable one for two. So what's the answer? Do we discard the wonderful parts? Do we make the miserable parts the defining factor? Well, well, no, it's, I think we, people are complex and relationships are complex. And uh, there is something to be, I think, learned from just the process of committing oneself to a relationship and and committing oneself to the growth uh, and and the patience and the 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 movement that comes with a relationship. And I really like to um, what you just mentioned about like the complexity of who we are as individuals, which then you know creates the complexity of what it's like to be in a relationship and that and maybe this is a western thing maybe it's also just a human being thing but that we tend to sometimes be very black and white about if this didn't work out then this defines me as something like this is a failure or a loser in this or whatever it is or loser in love or what it might be but that that one event or one relationship or one thing that happens is not a defining thing about a person or even a relationship even. Yeah, I think it's very, because let's face it, when we're in a, re, in a long-term relationship, especially whether that's whether you're married or just in a, you know, cohabiting, it's, you are known to your community. It could be your workplace. It could be your extended friends. Certainly, I'm sure it includes your family. And so in other words, you're on display. Your relationship is on display. And so when your relationship alters, whether it ends or not, but but when when sort of the the seams begin to show, it that is on display too. And that pressure can also certainly inform the discussions that happen around couples therapy and also the aftermath where it's just like, you know, how do I face my how do I face my parents and just tell them that uh, my partner and I are thinking about divorce? How how do I go out with my friends? You know, like normally we'd go out and, and we'd go see hockey or something, but I'm just absolutely freaking miserable because of what's happening right now. And I, I feel it only fair to tell them, but I don't want to bring them down. I don't want to be the bummer, you know? And so it's, you know, you, you can begin to see how, being in a couplehood, uh, being in a relationship is also part of a larger community, too, where you're kind of woven into your partner's friends and your friends and their family and your family and how the sort of tremors, uh, the potential breakup of that relationship can be damaging personally. 
That's so true. And I guess being the, the work that I do working with individuals, I'll often, based on what the individual needs are, would have maybe kind of almost like a role play, right? Of like, what are the ways in which you can talk about what's happening in your life? Um, what, what's happening in your relationship, whether you're uh, struggling and in the process of figuring it out or in the process of maybe dissolving the relationship or whatever it is. Is that something that you also do as part of couples work is maybe talk about how to talk about <laughs> what's going on with maybe just not, not, not just with themselves, but with others? I think it certainly does come up. And I think there can be one word that springs to mind is the word shame. And so I think that sort of admission to our friends and family and whomever, not always, but certainly there is this sense of defeatism. There's a sense uh, there can certainly be elements of shame. And as a therapist, I'm sure, uh, as certainly as a relational therapist, I'm, I'm sure you can understand how shame is this radioactive element, which just makes everything worse. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just curious to know, when you're working with couples, do you find that it's more of like a, a short term or a long term? Does it, I mean, does it, is it maybe more based on the the couples themselves? Like what, what do you find like in terms of your work with couples? Is it, um, is it generally an ongoing thing or maybe more short term? Yeah, it certainly is immediate. Nobody goes nobody nobody signs up for couples therapy because they're trying to solve existential questions there's there's typically something that they want to talk about and so there's an immediacy to couples therapy that you may not have with individual therapy so but to kind of answer your question or come towards an answer it does tend to be shorter term and that isn't to say that you know the relationship ends but rather it's I think a lot of people who come to couples therapy, they want to get a handle on the dynamic. They want to get a handle on what's happening uh, less than consciously and maybe discuss that individually. So one way I work with couples is that we'll have a number of sessions and then maybe we'll have a number of break off sessions where I'll meet with them individually in order to kind of allow them a little bit more comfort to expand upon things so that they don't feel like they're taking up too much oxygen in a couple session. And so th that's certainly one way I, I like to keep things open. And quite frankly, that's kind of a gold standard would be, you know, couples therapy ideally would include individual sessions so that everyone has their turn with me individually and in the couple setting. But, but yeah, generally speaking, couples therapy tends to be uh, shorter on average than individual therapy um, because I think it's, there are more, there's, 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 I guess there's a more definitive uh, sort of either conflict or more definitive sort of subject at hand. Yeah, I liked what you were saying earlier about how that maybe with more individual work, it can be more existential or like sometimes it could just be about trying to make something that feels like completely unwieldy, like sort of to try to make sense of it. Whereas perhaps with couples, uh, they have like a clear idea, maybe individually or as a couple of coming in and saying, this is the problem we're looking to solve. Yes. And I think uh, building on what you're saying, I certainly have a lot of, of individuals who come in and it'll be like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll ask in so many words, what's going on? And the answer will be, I have no clue, but I need to talk with someone, right? Whereas with couples, it's kind of like, you know, if I ask the same sort of question, what's going on? Chances are, it's kind of like, you know, we're driving each other ape shit, <laughs> you know, or something a lot more uh, declarative, so on that note, what are some things that you've witnessed in your work with couples that might have surprised you or something that you were maybe not expecting mm -hmm. when you engaged in the work? I guess, uh, you know, generally speaking, I find working with couples is sometimes like hosting a talk show where you're holding the microphone, thinking of like Phil Donahue or something. 
And you're kind of like, you're looking at the clock, you're holding the microphone, you want to be fair to everybody, but you also want to make sure that that this process makes sense, right? And that you're not just doing a straight 50-50 interview for the sake of doing a 50-50 interview, but rather that you're paying attention, not only the people or the persons who want to be heard, but also the person who you can tell is holding something back and making time so that you can like sort of elegantly or inelegantly have one person finish what they're saying and then kind of like draw a respectful attention to the person who maybe is less comfortable speaking openly. And that can be a very powerful moment where where somebody who isn't used to taking the microphone or isn't used to taking the floor is given that. And that can be a very hugely important moment. And just as a total aside, that's completely irrelevant, but like <laughs> generationally, like the fact that you use Phil Donahue <laughs> <laughs> as a talk show host example. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm, there, I'm there with you, yeah. but there might be some folks listening who are like, who's Phil Donahue? <laughs> uh, you know, at the end of the session, at the end of the session, I imagine credits rolling and like, you know, guests of Matt Cahill stay at the Delta Hilton, you know, it, it's, it's a very similar dynamic where it's just like couples therapy happens at twice the speed of, of mm. individual therapy, even though, even though it, I, so for the record, I give individual, uh, sessions 50 minutes and I give couple sessions 60 couple sessions happen faster because there's more information. There are, you have twice as many people who want to express themselves. And so you, you really have to be paying attention at all times. Well, and also to to even consider the dynamics that are happening, right? That there are multiple dynamics that are happening and pre-established dynamic between the couple, but then the dynamics between them and you and the individual. I mean, there's that's a lot to have to manage um, and to hold. Absolutely. And I think that's and I think that's one of the reasons why for me, I realized for the folks who are good at it and are gifted at it and talented with being able to to hold that space for folks, I think that's really is an amazing thing because I know for myself, like it would just be, I think, too fast and maybe too much. So it's, it's I think, really important, but also very difficult and challenging work. Yeah, it's certainly challenging. Um, based on your experience, what would you what would be a suggestion you might have maybe for all couples, either something to maybe keep in mind or something that can maybe actively help nurture a more solid relationship? Yeah, I, I think checking in with one another, not assuming that everything's OK because nobody's complaining, finding a way to just touch base about the relationship, even if it seems like everything's great. I, I think that, and that's the hardest thing to do, right? Because who wants to, who wants to potentially kick a hornet's nest if, if everything's okay, right? But, but I really do. Or seemingly okay. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Because, mm. you know, anyone who's, who's spent any amount of time on social media uh, knows that it's very easy for people to put on a patina of, of, you know, everything's great, everything's wonderful. And then you find out, however long uh, after that, no, things were actually quite miserable. Right. No, I think that's a really great thing. And But like you say, you know, it's simple enough to say, but a really more of a complicated, not not so easy thing to actually do, but so important to do. So Matt, thank you so much for your time. I really, really appreciate it. And we'll just end off with a couple more questions. One being, what would be a go-to book or a resource that you would uh, recommend for folks? I guess the, the two most popular or the two most popular sort of books I recommend. The first would be Daring Greatly by Brene Brown. I think she touches upon a number of concepts that both you and I would easily recognize from our training in relational psychotherapy. And she does so in a way which I think is very approachable from the sort of layperson's perspective. She can, her language can be a little TED talky, and that may not be an issue. It is for me sometimes. It's like sometimes I wish, it's like, look, just just 
talk like yourself. Don't worry about trying to quote unquote engage, right? But for for all intents and purposes, I really do think it's a solid book uh, and I have had clients respond to it. The other book I would recommend is Canadian author uh, Mark Lewis, who wrote a book called The Biology of Desire. And he is a neurologist who has previously struggled with substance use issues, who talks about the neurology of addiction. And, and I think it's a it's an underrated book, at least uh, internationally, and I would like uh, a little more people to be aware of it with respect to those who are trying to get handle on their substance dependencies or, to, or addictions. It's interesting because I'm actually looking at my copy of Daring Greatly. I guess this ah. is right in front of my, my eyesight or my eyeline. But Mark Lewis, um, and the name of the book again was? Uh, the Biology of Desire. I believe that's the title. Thank you for that. That sounds really, really great and fascinating. And just to cap things off, you know, I call this podcast Life Stuff 101 because, you know, I'm constantly learning new things. And, you know, every so often I'm like, oh, gosh, if I'd only known this, you know, <laughs> if someone had thought to teach me this earlier in life, you know, wouldn't it have been great if, if that was more of an organized thing, right? That was part of something that we learned. In your experience, what would you say is something that you would wish that maybe you had learned earlier in life or good to have known earlier? I, I think in general, I, I wish I'd had a better idea of my own sort of attachment identity. Uh, I also, you know, I think also the the larger sort of answer I have would be around those who maybe implicitly identify as being outsiders. I, I think it can be very difficult feeling that you are an outsider. Anyone can get like a tattoo that somehow symbolically or explicitly identifies them as some sort of outsider, whether or not they actually are. But for those of us who simply, by virtue of having, you know, eclectic interests and maybe a non-traditional childhood, uh, those of us who find ourselves really just not relating to the Norman Rockwell or the traditional idea of, of how kids grow up. I think I would have really appreciated uh, a perspective that told me at a young age that that's okay, that, that there's an advantage to that in some respects. Mm, that's great. My pleasure. Matt, thank you again. Where can folks find you if uh, they wanted to learn more about you? Well, so my web address for my therapy site is downtowntherapy.ca. I have a blog there and I try to keep it updated and I try to keep it on the on the international side. Sometimes I delve into local matters. And, you know, I'm also a, a novelist and writer and you can probably seek me out at my author site at mattkhill.ca. That's great. Thanks again, Matt. My pleasure. Once again, I'd like to thank Matt for joining me today. You can learn more about Matt's private practice in Toronto, Canada at downtowntherapy.ca and also more about his work as an author and writer at mattcahill.ca. As always, all these links are provided in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining me today, and please be sure to join me next week as we continue the series where we're discussing different aspects, experiences, and insights about relationships. To catch up on all the previous episodes, including the relationship-focused ones in the last few weeks, please visit lifestuff101.com. I'm so grateful to have you here, and especially especially if you're still listening right now, you've made it to the very end. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I do really hope you join me again next week. And in the meantime, I hope you have a lovely rest of the day or evening, wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to speaking to you again real soon. 
Thank you for listening to today's episode of Life Stuff 101. If you haven't already, please subscribe so that you'll be among the first to be notified when new episodes are released. Always be sure to check out lifestuff101.com for show notes and to be a member of Mio's Miracle Mob. Because as the wise modern day philosopher John Bon Jovi once said, miracles happen every day. Change your perception of what a miracle is and you'll see them all around you. 